Order. Uh, it is time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. As members are aware, standing orders now provide that topical questions will be taken after uh, the listed questions. So we will have 30 minutes of oral questions and then 15 minutes of topical questions. And if that is clear, I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Mr Nesbitt. Question number one, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The costs relating to the work of the panel of parties are being met by OFM DFM. These include the expenses incurred by the Haas team and any additional expenditures such as travel and subsistence directly relating to their work and a small remuneration to their researcher. We are projecting that the likely cost will be approximately £135,000, with costs to date totaling £73,000. It's important to record once again our appreciation of the fact that Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan have offered their services on a pro bono basis. They are therefore not taking a fee either for their time or for the time incurred by their press officer and an additional researcher. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, thank you. I thank the First Minister for his answer. He'll be aware that uh, he has a budget line of £2.2 million in the current year and £2.39 million uh, in 2014-15 for a body called Public Assemblies, Parades and Protest Body. Can I update the House on the activity of that organisation? Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, we of course do have funding made available for uh, anything that might arise out of the Haas talks. Uh, I hope, uh, as Dr Haas has indicated, that all parties are going to roll up their sleeves and come seriously to the table over the next number of weeks so that we might be able to uh, have some agreed conclusion as a result of the, the Haas uh, talks, uh, and the Department is ready to respond uh, to any conclusion that might be reached. Well, Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister, uh, for his view on whether a single independent legacy commission with a framework of investigation, information recovery, thematic inquiry and storytelling uh, could form the basis of a comprehensive mechanism for, uh, for dealing with the past as part of the, the Haas talks? Well, I think it is important that when we collectively appoint somebody to carry out the, the role of uh, facilitating uh, all party di dialogue on these matters, that uh, we do the negotiation uh, with the panel of parties rather than across the, the floor uh, of the Assembly. There are some aspects of that that uh, I would respond to warmly. Uh, there are others that I think would need to uh, be uh, drilled down uh, a little before we could uh, reach a, a conclusion. But uh, certainly there seems to be some consensus about uh, the uh, ability of victims to tell their stories uh, and tell them without uh, cross-examination or interrogation. Mr. Alec Maskey. Uh, could I ask the, the First Minister if, notwithstanding all the various challenges which they are facing the process in the weeks and months ahead, uh, what is the estimate would be of confidence in the ability of Mr. Haas and his team to bring forward a report by Christmas? Well, I think we need to be very clear that uh, this is not something by way of putting the onus uh, on Dr. Haas and, and Megan O'Sullivan. Uh, if there is going to be a positive outcome, it will be because the, the executive parties who are on that panel reach a conclusion, uh, and that depends very largely on whether they are going to retreat uh, into uh, old ways because there is an election or two coming up next year, or whether they are prepared to look at what is in the best long-term interest of the people of Northern Ireland. I hope it is the, the latter. Uh, my party is certainly uh, up for attempting to resolve differences in these matters. Uh, I think Undoubtedly, it will be more likely to get agreement uh, around issues uh, relating to uh, parades than it is to flags, and more uh, easy to get it on flags than the past. Well, Ms. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the recent comments of the SDLP that the Chair should bring forward his own recommendations, can the First Minister confirm what the remit of the panel is, both in relation to consultation and in resulting recommendations? Well, the, the, the panel has been working with uh, Dr Haas and Megan O'Sullivan uh, in the, the process of hearing the views of stakeholders and interested parties and individuals 
uh, around the province. That material is being collated uh, and uh, <coughs> the next stage uh, is the stage where we attempt to get uh, agreements. The terms of reference are very clear. The terms of reference put the onus on the, the panel to reach an agreement. They do not put the onus uh, on the facilitator. Uh, he is there to try and uh, urge and uh, meet the overall desire of the, the panel in reaching an agreement. Uh, it is not his role or responsibility to reach agreement uh, for us. Uh, I have no doubt that he may have uh, views. I have no doubt that he may want to express those views. But the recommendations, according to the terms of reference, will come from the panel alone. Mr. Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the First Minister agree that issues like dealing with the past are of such paramount importance to the people that the costs would be negligible in relation to the Haas process, in relation to the wider remit and uh, importance of making sure that we get the right outcomes at this juncture? Well, I have to say that I have always had difficulty in trying to define what people mean by dealing with the past. Uh, if dealing with the past requires us to have a shared narrative of history, I think it's uh, impossible for that to happen. Uh, if it's in relation to how do we deal with those who are the victims of the, the, the past, then I, I think it is possible to, to get agreement as to how we might ensure that those who have suffered as a result of the, the past uh, are treated in a way and have a proper place in the future uh, of Northern Ireland. Uh, I think that there are clearly a range of issues about how we deal with certain events of the, the past that have caused very considerable problems over the, the last number of, of months. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, how on the one side it is possible for people to look uh, at an event in the past as something that uh, re-traumatizes them uh, and somebody else at the same time to think that this is something worthy of celebration uh, or commemoration. I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Question number two, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Deputy First Minister and I travelled to Boston and Chicago from the 21st to the 25th of October for a number of engagements to promote the Northern Ireland business message and to build on the hugely successful economic conference. Our five-day visit was an opportunity to reinforce our bonds with existing and potential investors in the US, to promote Northern Ireland as an attractive investment location and to promote healthcare and university collaboration. Our attendance at a significant EU-US connected health conference in Boston, attended by an international audience from over 20 countries, provided a platform to showcase our growing expertise in the connected health arena. We are pleased to have the support of our colleague, the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety, who also spoke at the conference. We highlighted the wider research and development agenda at meetings with representatives of the US universities who have established links with Queen's University Belfast and the University of Ulster. In Boston, we addressed an audience of some 170 senior business executives on the competitive advantages that Northern Ireland has to offer. In Chicago and Peoria, we visited Chicago Mercantile Exchange and Caterpillar. These are two of our most important US investors. The visit to Caterpillar allowed us to meet with the company's top management team and to reiterate the executive support for consolidating relationships with existing investors. While there, we were particularly pleased to welcome a further investment by Caterpillar to expand its manufacturing business here. This reinforces our position as an investment location for global companies. Caterpillar is an important investor, not only in terms of jobs and wealth creation, but also in the credibility its presence gives to doing business in Northern Ireland. In summary, the visit provided an excellent opportunity to strengthen relationships with existing investors and to begin relationships with potential new ones. It was an extremely successful visit, and we look forward to seeing the fruits of that in the months to come. Again, I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan for a supplementary. Can I thank the First Minister for his answer there? Given the success and First Minister of the recent trip to the United States, could you indicate whether there are any other investment trips planned? Well, of course, the, the, the Minister responsible for enterprise trade and investment uh, is constantly uh, going out around the, the world uh, to, to try and encourage investors into Northern Ireland. Uh, the next uh, visit that the Deputy First Minister and I are making uh, is to Japan uh, in the first week in December. Uh, we are invited there. The invitation came from the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Abe. Uh, when he was here at the uh, G8 summit, 
Uh, so we look forward to meeting some of the Japanese companies who already are investing uh, in Northern Ireland uh, and hopefully some potential new ones. Call Mr. Patsy McGlone. Uh, I guess my house and I recall my house and the Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and uh, my thanks to the First Minister for his answer. Could the First Minister provide us with any detail, any progress that has been made since the investment conference held recently in Belfast here? Yes, the uh, Invest Northern Ireland undertook uh, the, the task of the follow-up work. Uh, it is involved in speaking to, to companies that uh, were present uh, and those who made positive uh, remarks during the course uh, of the, uh, the conference. Uh, we have no doubts that there, there will be positive news arising from the economic uh, conference, but obviously these matters take some time. Board decisions have to be taken and follow-up work has to go on between companies uh, and Invest Northern Ireland uh, in relation to any incentives that might be offered. Ms. Fran McGowan. Is the First Minister confident that his forthcoming investment trip to Japan will uh, yield further inward investment and jobs? Well, I have to say that uh, in keeping with every other uh, visit that we have made, there have been positive outcomes. Uh, in relation to uh, Japan, uh, obviously there is the issue of the potential of the inward investment. But not that alone, because wherever we go, we attempt to uh, encourage the people in that uh, jurisdiction to come to Northern Ireland uh, as visitors to aid our, our tourist industry. And we also look at the opportunities that might be there uh, in terms of trade between uh, our, our two countries. So we're in all of those uh, areas, we, are, we would expect to be making some uh, progress. And of course, it does need to be uh, pointed out that we do already have very significant investment from Japan. Mr. Alistair Macdonald. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three, please. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, on the 28th of February, the Social Investment Fund Steering Group submitted area plans for each of their zones. Representatives of the wider community were involved in identifying the issues to be addressed and prioritising the interventions for inclusion in the plan, thus ensuring that they reflect needs identified locally. The plans included a total of 89 projects across nine zones, prioritised by the steering group in each investment zone. In contrast to recent reports, there is no outstanding decision by ministers in relation to zone allocations. Approximately £40 million of projects have successfully come through the robust internal economic uh, appraisal process. Officials are meeting with all the chairs of the steering groups this week to talk through the indicative budget for each zone and the process of project implementation. I expect projects that are successfully through the process to be informed over the next few weeks. We anticipate further announcements on this very shortly. And I call uh, Mr. Alistair Macdonald. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I thank the First Minister for his update and, and welcome the, the good bits uh, contained, there, contained therein, the good news contained therein. But uh, could he give us some indication as to what assessment or what parameters are used in terms of assessing whether projects are worthy or not? And perhaps could he, could he uh, reassure us that monies will be allocated by and large ob objectively on the basis of need, objective need? Well, uh, on the, the latter point, uh, yes, of course, the, the, the whole purpose of the project is to, to try and address uh, need. Of course, ob objective uh, need became a difficult issue to, to measure because the zones are of different sizes. So it wasn't simply a case of uh, making a determination as if they were all the same size. So we had to take into account objective need, the uh, size of the, the areas, uh, and also SIF, of course, is part of our overall suite of measures within the Delivering Social Change policy in our department. So obviously we had uh, an eye on uh, other allocations within the, the overall objective of Delivering Social Change. Ms. Michelle McElveen. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can the First Minister outline how much more than the, 80, the 89 projects totaled than the £80 million funding pot? And what action is he considering taking to support those who will not benefit from the Social Investment Fund? Well, uh, as uh, the, the House uh, will probably have guessed already, uh, the applications came for considerably more than the 80 million. I think it was about 130 million uh, when they were uh, totaled. Uh, so clearly they are being addressed on the basis of the priorities that the zones themselves uh, placed on them. Uh, but they do have to go through a, a robust business case. Uh, and uh, the Department and the uh, Department of Finance and Personnel are obviously involved in that. Uh, that means that there is a shortfall. Uh, obviously, towards the end of the scheme, we'll make some assessment of the, the value of uh, SIF and whether it should be uh, extended. Though the Deputy First Minister and I uh, have been looking at uh, whether there is a, a case uh, for us to, to determine uh, whether we would take applications for some uh, smaller grant schemes that uh, we would look at, and there had been some indication that we might look at uh, having £1 million of schemes, maybe 50 at uh, £20,000 each, uh, and clearly those who were unsuccessful in coming through the initial tranche uh, might be looking to that kind of scheme if uh, that is given approval by the Department. Mr. Pat Sheehan. I'm going to free last concord. I'm going to go back to the station and free you, Ara. I wonder, could the First Minister give an indication of when money is likely to hit the ground to fund uh, area priorities? Well, the one thing that we have been certain about is that uh, the money was ring-fenced, uh, so nobody else is going off to spend it. The money is there to be spent, and we want to get it out through the door as quickly uh, as possible. Uh, as I indicated, uh, if there was something like uh, £120 million of schemes, we have about uh, £40 million, slightly more than £40 million of schemes that have already gone through uh, the, the process. Uh, there is no reason why we can't start providing they are uh, in the top two of the zone's priorities. There is no reason why immediately money can't start going out uh, towards those schemes. Uh, and that is the purpose of the discussions that will take place between the uh, chairperson of uh, each of the, the zones uh, and officials over the coming days. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I thank the First Minister for his answers. But would he confirm that this fund has been delayed because of a failure to agree on the split between mainly nationalist and mainly unionist communities? Uh, no, I wouldn't uh, confirm that. Uh, the, uh, the processes within our department are not as vulgar uh, as that. Uh, because if uh, one was to, to look at the schemes that have come forward, a very high proportion of those uh, schemes uh, are schemes that will benefit both sections of our uh, community. Uh, and indeed, if one was to look at the various zones, uh, even where a particular section of the community might be in a significant minority, uh, they have been treated well in terms of the overall allocation of schemes from the, the zone. Uh, so I think uh, when the, the schemes start to get played out, uh, we will see that they have contributed to the overall community cohesion that I think it would be the, the members wish. Thank you, and I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Number four. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I'll ask Junior Minister John Bell to answer this question. Thank you, Principal, Deputy Speaker. On the 23rd of May this year, <clears throat> we published the Good Relations Strategy Together Building a United Community which is designed to bring about interaction, mutual respect and social cohesion across our community. The strategy contains over 40 separate actions and commitments. Seven of these are the headline actions announced on the 9th of May, and we have tasked design groups to work up proposals for the indicative costs and implementation timescales for these projects. Recognising and valuing the importance of projects and groups currently engaged in the areas that the strategy will impact upon, officials have begun an intensive period of engagement with key stakeholders to seek their input into the design process. Following that engagement, we expect the design groups to be in a position to report back to us uh, in the near future. Through this early engagement, we have been able to identify areas where it will be possible to trial some activities, uh, building on the positive relationships 
and the good community work that is already in place prior to full-scale operation. These trials will allow and enable real outputs linked to the strategic aims and objectives of the strategy to be achieved in the near term. The remaining actions and commitments range from the longer term projects around, for example, the introduction of the new Equality and Good Relations Commission, which will require primary legislation to shorter term uh, and more immediate actions. We're working closely with our other relevant departments to progress all of those issues and actions. And I call Mr Gregory Campbell. And does the junior minister agree with me that building a united community is made much easier uh, for the future if uh, people are clear about their past? Uh, and further to that, does he agree that across the community people know those who were engaged in terror in the past and they do want frank and honest admissions as we try to build a united community? And above all, they know the issues that are out there that, and they know the difference between genuine responses and those responses that are synthetic? Well, I think we would call upon everybody that has any information uh, in relation to either their own past or uh, information that they are aware of, of criminality and terrorism, um, to bring that forward uh, to the police. Uh, that is because it is the right thing to do and it is the imperative uh, on everyone uh, to take on that responsibility and to fess up, as it were, uh, to their past, uh, not only to what they have done, but also for the benefit uh, of those who are suffering and for whom that information could be very helpful. Of course, the justice process continues, uh, and uh, there will always be the, the legal justice process, and therefore anybody involved in any crime should be made amenable to that process. Ms. Michaela Boyle. Can the Minister give us an update at this time on the United Youth Programme? Well, we are continuing to work with a number of agencies together. As junior ministers, we were out recently in Belfast, seeing on the ground what is already happening between young people from the Hammer Youth Club in the Shankill and also from the Ardoin Youth Club associated with uh, Holy Cross. Uh, as our officials continue to work up the programme, as I outlined in my earlier answer, we will bring details to the House in due course. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal, the big speaker. Just following on, Minister, from that, could, could you uh, perhaps share with us which departments are likely to be involved uh, and whether Dale will be taking the lead in this case? That is on the um, United Youth programme. Well, there, I mean, given the cross-curricular, as it were, nature of many of the government departments, we will be involving each of them, and uh, we regularly have uh, bilateral meetings with each of the individual ministers in areas where they have responsibility. In specific relation to Dell, uh, Minister Farre has met with us uh, on a number of occasions. In fact. Uh, we, we have been launching with him uh, projects that, where there is a synergy between our two departments, um, and there is no divisions or difficulties. All government departments are working together uh, on the programme. And where it's appropriate to involve them, or where it's appropriate to, to utilise that expertise and that research, we will do so. Well, Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, yes, we will be meeting with the Minister for the Department of the Environment in the near future to discuss the position the Executive should take on this matter. It would have been better if the Minister uh, had had this meeting before he made uh, his announcement. The issue of planning remains a key element in the development of our local economy. It is still the case that many of the potential investors that we speak with throughout the world who are looking to invest in Northern Ireland have been put off by our planning system. It is internationally recognised that Northern Ireland has a poor, poor planning outcome. An example of this is Sainsbury's Chief Executive Justin King's remarks when he said that a lack of speed, logic and joined up thinking when it came to issues, uh, issuing planning permissions makes Northern Ireland a challenging place in which to invest. 
If we are serious about getting jobs into Northern Ireland, we need to look at our planning system and ensure that it delivers the right outcomes. We call Mr. Michael Copeland. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And, and I understand exactly what the Minister uh, means. Does he ever accept that the current position indicates that the amendments tabled by Sinn Féin and the DUP were held to be illegal following legal advice which was sought? And who would he agree with me that, given these facts, the original bill without the amendments is probably better than no bill at all? Well, I don't accept the premise upon which uh, his question was asked. Uh, <laughs> I think we, we all know that there are differing legal opinions. Uh, the Attorney General takes one position. Uh, the uh, QC, who is advising the Department, takes a, a different position on these matters. It seems to me that uh, the right thing to do would have been to put the legislation through the Assembly uh, and allow it to be tested uh, in the, the courts uh, if necessary. Uh, I, I hope that we can reach some uh, agreement as to how we sh should go forward. Uh, there are a number of uh, options available uh, to us, uh, and I, I know that uh, the member will be aware that this forms part of the economic pact that uh, we signed uh, on behalf of the executive with the Prime Minister. It is therefore uh, executive policy. Ministers are required to, uh, of course, uh, meet all the decisions that uh, are taken by the executive and uh, uphold them, so I, I hope we can get away through this uh, particular problem. Call Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal uh, Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister to clarify, as he's mentioned, that the planning provisions were a key part of the economic package that were agreed with the, the Prime Minister, and the planning bill itself had passed uh, by the Assembly at consideration stage, whether he believes that the Environment Minister is in breach of the Pledge of Office? Well, clearly, the, the Pledge of Office does require every minister to act in accordance with decisions taken by the executive. The executive took a clear decision uh, on these uh, matters. Uh, it is recorded in the minutes of the executive meeting. So, yes, he is in breach of the, the pledge uh, of office. Uh, however, uh, without going into uh, his position, I think it is important that we resolve the issue uh, and move forward on planning. Uh, planning continues to be a significant problem in Northern Ireland. We have to uh, address that, uh, and it will require new legislation to address some of the weaknesses in the planning system at present. Mr. Mickey Brady. Can I ask the Minister to outline any concerns that have been raised by large scale investors while on investment visits about the perception of our planning processes? Well, certainly, when the Deputy First Minister and I have been out and about trying to uh, encourage business to, to come, uh, I can recall, for instance, uh, being uh, in Australia when I was uh, DRD Minister. Uh, and, uh, because there was some news coverage of it out in Australia, I was asked to meet one of the most significant development companies in the world to find that the person who was in charge of uh, finding locations was someone who had originally lived in Northern Ireland, someone who therefore wanted to invest in Northern Ireland but wouldn't go near Northern Ireland with a barge pole because of the length of time it took to get planning applications through and the likelihood of judicial reviews even when you get the planning permission through. So, there are many problems out there, uh, and we do bury our heads in the sand if we aren't prepared to face up to those. The, the Deputy First Minister and I are, are not saying that our way is the only way that it can be done, but nobody has suggested a better way of ensuring that we improve the system. Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, uh, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, during a television interview recently, um, the Minister's uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Samuel Wilson, uh, said, and, and quoting from memory, that um, the two amendments from the planning bill could be brought forward either by a private member's bill or by the Minister for ETI, uh, Ali, uh, Ms., Mrs. Arlene Foster. Um, can the Minister uh, clarify if this is the position the UP is taking? No, the, the position that we are taking is that the Deputy First Minister and I have uh, agreed with the Minister responsible for the Department of Environment that we should sit down and try and resolve these issues. Uh, it is far better that we can get uh, some mutually satisfactory uh, outcome. Uh, of course, I, as I indicated to the member for East Belfast, who even though we are still on his question, has left uh, the, the, the chamber. Uh, I, I indicated that there are a number of options open to us 
Uh, and one of those uh, options clearly is that a private member's bill could be brought forward. Another option is that another minister could bring the bill forward. But the best option by far is that we get some agreement with the minister responsible for the department as to how we move forward. And that ends the, uh, the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions, and I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. Mr. McQuillan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. First Minister, as we approach the anniversary of the Belfast City Council's decision to remove the Union flag and the protest march planned for the 30th of November, do you, as First Minister, believe that this should take place? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think the first thing that we should say is that. There are very few people in this chamber uh, who have not been involved at some stage in their careers in uh, protest politics. Uh, so uh, I, I think we, we need to recognise that demonstrations and protests and picket are, are picketing are part of the democratic process. It allows people to express their, their views. It allows them to show uh, opposition. So, of course, uh, we support people's right to, to demonstrate. Uh, providing, of course, that they do it within the law and they do it uh, peacefully. Uh, equally, of course, we have to defend other rights and the rights of uh, traders uh, who want to ensure that uh, their businesses can remain open and that they have the opportunity, particularly in the run-up to, to Christmas, which accounts for a significant part of their, their business, uh, to be able to, to trade. And there's the rights, of course, of uh, consumers uh, who want to avail of uh, those uh, services. So, uh, as is so often the case in Northern Ireland, we are dealing with uh, competing rights. Uh, I have to say that it seems to me that in relation to this matter, uh, as the actual anniversary of the decision by Fel Belfast City Council uh, comes earlier in the week than the, the, the Saturday, uh, and also that uh, the decision uh, led to the flag being lowered, which occurred other than on the, the Saturday. It appears to me that uh, a lunchtime protest would do less violence to trade in Belfast, uh, would more accurately uh, be able to protest against the people who took the decision, because I suspect very few of them are going to be in the City Hall on a, a Saturday. Uh, and while it's not ideal for anybody, it, it would be a worthwhile compromise. Call in for a supplementary. I thank the First Minister for his answer. Does the First Minister believe that such demonstrations can succeed in effect and change? Well, I, I'm not sure that even the organisers believe that they will affect change by the, the protests. Protests, and we've all been involved in them, uh, are held to highlight an issue uh, to ensure that uh, people are aware of concerns. And I suspect that the objective of uh, this particular demonstration is to show that even a year afterwards that uh, people uh, are still opposed to the decision of the, the, the Council. Uh, if change is to take place, change will take place through the democratic process, involvement in politics, involvement uh, in uh, elections, making sure that people who represent your views are elected to Belfast City Council in the future. That's the way to make uh, real change. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, at his party conference on Saturday, uh, the leader of NI21 proposed greater physical powers, or uh, fiscal powers, uh, sorry, <laughs> for the Assembly. For the Assembly. Uh, does the First Minister agree with him? Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, we have, of course, uh, as an executive, sought additional fiscal powers. Uh, and unlike other parts of the United Kingdom, we have been successful, for instance, in our passenger duty for long-haul uh, flights. We are also pursuing the additional fiscal powers in relation to corporation tax. Uh, however, I think that the, the member for Lagan Valley uh, was referring to income tax uh, powers. Uh, I, I note that the, the member didn't tell anybody during the course of his uh, speech whether his intention was to raise or to lower taxes. And I'm always suspicious about people who seek a headline, perhaps without having done any research, uh, and uh, don't give details of what their intentions uh, are. Um, I suppose the Basel tax uh, might be to uh, have an additional tax burden on a uh, woman over size 12, uh, or perhaps uh, <laughs> give tax breaks to uh, polygamists. 
Sir Jimmy Spratt. <laughs> thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank uh, the First Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask them what the executive are doing with the uh, t- tax raising powers it already has uh, to make business more competitive uh, and to keep the cost of living down uh, in relation to householders right around this province? Well, I think we should point out that we have the ability in terms of local taxes, because within local taxes you could refer to the regional rate, you could refer to water charges and so forth. Uh, and it is worth noting that Scotland has had a power in relation to income tax for about 14 years now and has never used it. And that maybe should be a lesson to to, to people as to what's likely to happen uh, if it was to come here. But if we are to reduce income tax by having a local power, then that means reducing the services that are available to our community. Uh, So uh, I haven't been convinced that there is uh, any real advantage in having income tax powers uh, devolved. As to what we are doing already, we have used uh, the the ability to uh, bring to zero air passenger duty to ensure that we retain the connection uh, with the United States, which was vital from an investment point of view. Uh, We are seeking to have uh, the ability to set uh, corporation tax uh, because we want to reduce it to uh, enhance our offering uh, in terms of uh, the package that is available to uh, investors. So for us, uh, it's in order to have a positive outcome with our uh, economy that we have uh, used it. And where we have held down the regional rate and where we have refused to bring in water charges because we recognise that particularly during this period of recession that there was a very heavy burden being carried by householders in Northern Ireland. Ms Judith Cochrane. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, in the wake of a further attack on a constituency office, um, attacks on the police and the shooting of a 15-year-old child, could I ask the First Minister whether he feels that the executive ministers are doing enough to separate themselves from those who are seeking to threaten democracy and the rule of law? Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I have already publicly expressed our condemnation of, of uh, these actions. Uh, and I, I do sense a feeling within our community uh, almost of helplessness to be able to uh, affect what is uh, happening uh, by violent uh, organisations and individuals. Uh, but the public isn't powerless in these uh, matters. Uh, we all have the ability uh, to stand up to agitators and uh, aggressors, uh, no matter who they claim to represent. We have the right and uh, ability to speak out against them. Uh, We can provide evidence where it's available uh, to the police to ensure that prosecutions take place. And we must always show them that uh, they cannot succeed and demonstrate that the more they do, the more they will be resisted. Uh, Everyone in this House, I believe, can recall the days uh, when we woke up uh, in the morning to headlines of mayhem and misery. Uh, and we can all recount the horrors and tragedies uh, of the past. I don't believe anyone wants to go back to those uh, bad old uh, days. Uh, And when devolution returned uh, to Northern Ireland in 2007, uh, we all committed ourselves, pledged ourselves, uh, to this uh, new era in Northern Ireland and to the peace and stability that had been created. Uh, And I hope that each of us will renew that pledge today. Ms. Judith Cochran for a supplement. Thank you, and I thank First Minister for his answer. Um, public opinion would suggest that it's important that, that no elected representative sent mixed messages um, or give comfort or cover to those who would advocate breaking the law. Could I ask, would the First Minister now call on Nelson McCausland to stop sharing platforms and media opportunities with people who are widely considered to have links to paramilitary organisations? Well, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, I think everybody recognises that elected representatives have clear responsibilities with their own constituents to try and do everything that they can to ensure that uh, peace is maintained. Uh, And the the role of every elected representative in this House is to ensure that they do make those views known to everybody that they meet uh, in society uh, and to do everything that they possibly can to overcome the the difficulties that uh, may present them. And I have no doubt that the, uh, the Minister 
uh, for social development uh, uses all of his powers of persuasion to attempt to resolve the, the issues which are causing real difficulty in his constituency and elsewhere. I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Um, can I ask uh, the First Minister if he and the Deputy First Minister can confirm or deny uh, that they agreed to the withdrawal of the Noro Water Bridge letter of offer by the SEUPB at the pre-meeting of the recent North-South Ministerial Council? Quite contrary to, to that uh, position, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, agreed at the meeting that uh, took place of the British Irish Council that we would uh, examine uh, other ways of trying to keep the project alive. Uh, we both indicated that, uh, in principle, we were supportive of the, the project. We recognised that the application came from uh, Louth Council. Uh, we recognised that uh, there was a projected uh, cost uh, attached to it, that the SEUPB uh, was to give a certain amount of money and the Council was to pay the rest. Uh, when the projected figures were found to be significantly less than the actual uh, tender price, it became clear that uh, Louth Council could not uh, and was not prepared to pay the, the balance. Uh, the uh, position, therefore, is that we have to look at the, the project and see whether it can be brought forward in any, any other way. Uh, for instance, it was specifically mentioned that it uh, was a pre-designed scheme, uh, and we might look and see whether a design and build scheme uh, would bring a, a better result. We might look and see if a different specification might bring a, a different result, and we might look and see whether uh, there is any other opportunity for funding to come forward. Sir Dominic Bradley. I think the First Minister for his uh, answer. And can I ask him, given where we are now with the Nora Water Bridge, will he go to the, the Minister of Finance and ask him to find new monies so that Belfast jumps first and that this great project uh, goes forward? Well, the SEUP have already indicated that they are looking to allocate the funds elsewhere because they don't believe that uh, they can proceed uh, with the present timetable, uh, and we must respect their, their decision. Uh, they have the responsibility to ensure that money is spent uh, and that they were not handing money back to, to Europe without having any local uh, advantage. So I think it's important that we do ensure that we get uh, as much funding as possible from Europe. It's part of our program for government that we do. And therefore, we don't want any time delay uh, to have a, an impact uh, on us. As far as going to the finance minister, the, the finance minister has to act within Treasury rules, just as uh, in the, the South, they have to uh, operate on the, the basis of value for money in a business case as well. Uh, therefore, any uh, proposal has to be able to get through that uh, business appraisal. Uh, the original price uh, that we were offered for the, the, the scheme of the original uh, projected figure uh, was clearly satisfactory, or the then Finance Minister, Sammy Wilson, would not have approved the, the business case at that stage. Uh, but a business case on the basis of the new tender figure would not get a, a approval. Uh, and therefore, we do need to, to look at what other ways there are of ensuring that we can have a project that uh, gives a, a value for money outcome uh, can go forward. Mr. Sidney Anderson. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the First Minister that in light of the recent comedy surrounding the stalled uh, welfare reform bill, can the First Minister give an assessment of when the bill will be back on the floor of this Assembly and what specific Northern Ireland measures have been agreed? Well, I can't say exactly when it's going to come back in the Assembly because we, we require to have uh, cross-party support for legislation that uh, comes forward. Uh, I find it a bit frustrating in that it's not actually the bill that is the, the issue. It's the regulations that are attached to the, the bill. So perhaps uh, one way forward is for the, the bill to go through its early stages, leave the final stage until the uh, draft regulations are available and people can see uh, what the, the content uh, of them would be. Uh, but the proposals that uh, we do have are proposals which uh, ensure that Northern Ireland 
uh, would uh, be, have the best welfare system uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, we have uh, addressed a, a number of uh, issues, uh, the three in particular that uh, were raised in the Assembly and by the, the, the Committee have been addressed and those were effectively matters that dealt with the administration, the, the uh, number of occasions when payments would be made, etc. Uh, in addition to that, I think it's already publicly known that uh, we have attempted to uh, address the issue of bedroom tax for existing uh, tenants. That is something that um, I suspect that tenants in England, Scotland and Wales would uh, take their, their right arm for. Uh, so uh, it's a significant uh, advance. And we've also looked at uh, how, with uh, the use of resources, we can help uh, other people who are vulnerable. Order. It's, uh, that's